Welcome to this special session of the MOOC in Platform Thinking. Today, I'm very glad to have here as a guest, Alessandro Tensini. And the very first question I'd like to ask you, Alessandro, is if you can tell us where you work and what's your background. Hello, it's a pleasure to be invited here. Uh, I'm Alessandro Tansini, I said, uh, energy engineer with a background on power production and automotive systems. And for the past five years, I've worked at the uh, European Commission Joint Research Center. You know, this kind of question usually is, is kind of easy in these uh, kind of uh, sessions because people that are being interviewed here are working for digital platforms you know, the, the topic of this course. Well, you have a completely different background and uh, you work for a company that's for an organization that doesn't really look like a digital platform. And the reason why you are here is for something that happened a couple of weeks, I would say, ago. Actually, the two of us know each other. We were talking at the phone and, uh, <laughs> and something kind of strange happened. He, he asked me what kind of car I was driving and when it was being, when it was produced. Certified. Certified. And well, I didn't know, I had to, to search for it. And at that point, he started asking strange questions, at least to me, regarding my willingness to have this object in my, in my car for, for, for a bit of time. Alessandro, can you please tell us, to the people listening to us, why were you interested in those, uh, in those features of my new car? Sure, okay. Uh, as said, I don't work with uh, digital platforms. I work in a research center where we uh, deal with uh, sustainable transport and we are interested in uh, monitoring the real-world fuel efficiency and energy consumption of passenger cars. Not only passenger cars, uh, also heavy duty vehicles sometimes and commercial vehicles, but this specific device is uh, developed to be used on uh, passenger cars. And this uh, specific device monitors uh, the private use of car cars. And why do we need that? Every vehicle when certified is type approved with a nominal value of fuel consumption. So when you have to buy a car, you check uh, online or on uh, the material provided by the manufacturer, and you will see, you are told that your vehicle will consume a certain amount of fuel in mixed condition or urban condition, highway conditions, and you trust these values. These values... Just to bring it to a very simple... Uh level because it's kind of out of topic for, for, this, for this setting. You're talking about the number of kilometers that you can do with a liter of, of fuel, for example. Yes, exactly. Okay, exactly. so the values that you see when you buy the car that might be kind of similar or not when you actually drive it. That's what you meant, right? Exactly. To bring an example, when you uh, check for the details of a car, you might read somewhere this car uh, consumes five liters per 100 kilometer of distance driven. So this is the nominal value, but this might differ from reality because this data, this specific value is uh, derived under certain conditions obtained in the laboratory. And in real world, you might have different conditions like climatic conditions or use conditions that uh, might cause the difference. So with this device, we want to monitor the real world fuel efficiency of vehicles. And this is important for us to monitor the efficiency or better effectiveness of a certification procedure for vehicles. We can monitor if there is a gap and how big it is between the nominal value and the real world value. So if you consume more than the nominal value, we can understand with this device. And hopefully we can also understand why, what's the, the, the factor that causes that deviation. The first thing that you asked me when we start talking about this thing was when my car was certified. Why does this matter? So this specific feature of my car was, was relevant. It matters because I needed to check on the availability of a feature that new cars have. Uh, new cars certified with the latest emission standard, Euro 6 AP, uh, but depending on the country, there might be different acronyms. 
uh, with this latest emission standard, vehicles need to store in the control units some pieces of information, like the total distance driven, the total uh, amount of fuel consumed in the lifetime. And if it is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, there are additional information. For example, the amount of electric energy that was charged into the battery. So because of this feature, data is available in a standardized way in, in control units of the vehicle. And this data can be extracted, extracted from the vehicle. So I wanted to know, I needed to know whether your car was compatible with this new feature. And this is something that you confirmed me with the date of production and also the acronym for the emission standards. And then I knew that I could use your car for the project. Okay, so you are telling me that uh, my car is generating data on what the car actually does. It's storing them and it's doing it all by itself, by default. That's something that is happening by law and it's happening thanks to a technology that is within the car. Exactly. The technology is nothing new, but every manufacturer was doing this in a, in a custom way, let's say. But as of 2021, with the latest emission standard, this is standardized. So every manufacturer will have to implement this feature following specific rules and complying with uh, accuracy uh, requirements. So I can plug this to your vehicle and extract the information. I can plug it to the future vehicle I will buy and extract, uh, extract the information in the same way. So that's what's new. And the acronym for this new feature, it's OBFCM, Onboard Fuel Consumption Monitoring. And this is what we take advantage of for our project. Okay, so you're telling me that all the car manufacturers are actually doing this in the same way. So all these data will be comparable, can actually be used together and so on and so forth. Is this something happening only in Europe or is this happening also in other territories? Uh, to my knowledge so far, only Europe. So it's a European regulation so yes, far. Yes, the regulation is surely European. Then uh, this specific technology or let's say the format of the signals might be available in other countries then I don't know if in other countries this is mandatory it has to be monitored like we are going to do in Europe and so on but definitely there is a European regulation um, forcing manufacturers to implement this feature and as a um, research center of the European Commission we will be looking into this data. Okay so you are telling me that starting today I will have this on my in my car can you telling can you tell me something more about what it is what kind of data are actually available gathered through this thing and how it works sure uh, although very small it is packed with uh, a lot of uh, hardware uh, it's open source hardware with the open source software that we developed to our own uh, requirements and, and needs and desires. Uh, Sorry, so it's something developed by your center or it's developed for centers like your Hardware, it's open source hardware that you can buy online. And there is a person who gathered all the hardware and packed it together in this uh, enclosure. We bought this enclosure with hardware and we also downloaded the open source software made available by the developer. But then we are developing the software to our needs, let's okay. say. Uh, so we have implemented the new feature that I explained before, OBFCM uh, data collection, uh, so that this device, which initially was not able to uh, gather this data, is now able to gather this data, and this, devi this device sends data to the internet. So I will explain uh, a bit more how this is achieved. Uh, this is an um, Arduino-compatible uh, device. It has an Arduino-compatible board with another microprocessor that uh, connects to the uh, onboard diagnostic port of vehicles. Which is the one that people use when yeah. they are fixing your car, right? Exactly, exactly. They are used at the mechanics or when the vehicle undergoes service and maintenance. 
So we take advantage of the same port for communicating with the vehicle. And the microprocessor is developed in such a way that sends the correct request to get OBFCM data. The data is uh, returned from the control unit, the OBFCM data. Then this device also has a cellular module and a Wi-Fi module so that it has connectivity and it can connect to our server uh, so that we get the data that is being uh, read um, instantaneously, so real time. Uh, it also has a GPS uh, sensor, so we get the positioning and other sensors uh, from the device like temperature, voltage, this is to track how the, the device is operating. I think this is it, more or less. Okay, so basically this is reading data from my car and adding somehow other data to the ones you'll be receiving. So you know where I am thanks to this, not because of my car, but because of this sensor, right? Yes, yes. So positioning comes from uh, the GPS module that is embedded in this uh, device, but from OBD, onboard diagnostics, we get both OBFCM data, so the onboard fuel consumption moni monitoring data that I introduced before, but also other instantaneous uh, signals that the car makes available for other reasons, which is vehicle speed, maybe ambient temperature, uh, accelerator pedal pressure, so I know how much you're stepping on the accelerator pedal, uh, might be engine load, might be other, let's say, um, information about how the vehicle is running, for example, the, the rotational speed of the engine. So we get quite a big amount of data, uh, which we use to characterize uh, the driving uh, behavior of citizens. Not because we want to track citizens, but because we are interested to understand in the fleet at country level, how vehicles are used. So for example, the average driven distance in one day or the average velocity. This, uh, this is very interesting and is generating another question, which is how many people <laughs> are you expecting to convince <laughs> to use this, this kind of device? Not obviously the exact number, but a, an order of magnitude. For this project, we are still in a very preliminary phase. This is the first uh, let's say, deployment of a, of a technology like that and a device like that. We have about 30 devices, uh, which we are distributing to people that somehow we know. Uh, because at this point, it's a bit hard to find people that is willing to have a device in their car without knowing who exactly is getting the data. So we try to reach out to people that somehow know what we are doing, that we are not doing uh, because we want to monitor their private life, but we do it because of our needs at work. Um, so far we have distributed about 10 devices, more or less, in different countries in Europe. Uh, hopefully we are going to distribute another 10 very soon. But when everything is in place, then such a system, so uh, a device that sits in the car and connects remotely to uh, a centralized server to communicate this data. Uh, when this is in place, uh, we want thousands of vehicles to be covered by this uh, project, obviously in a more structured way with uh, encrypted data so that privacy is uh, ensured. That's interesting. So let's, uh, this is kind of the startup phase of, of, of this project, definitely. but you are planning to have it definitely wider. Um, <laughs> when, when you presented this to me, we were at the phone, so I, I couldn't really see this, this object. But actually, I, I kind of remember it, even though I've never seen this one. Because when we started doing research on, on platforms, it was 2014, there was a case that is called automatic, that is, to me at least, pretty similar, but white, and <laughs> from the United States that actually had this connector for cars and was promising to people uh, something slightly different. The goal, that, that's a B2C, so that's a consumer product that was uh, aiming to tell people something more about their driving style. 
just an example I remember for, from the advertisement of this product. It was kind of, you know, if you push the pedal in different ways, you can save a lot of fuel. And if you have someone that constantly look at how you're actually doing it, it can give you practical, um, practical advice on how you can help the planet and save money using less, less fuel. I never bought it, but I was very interested in it from a, from a research perspective because this was very similar to what you, we were doing with, uh, with our research. So these companies that are gathering a huge amount of data and uh, uh, this data can be valuable for someone else. When I told you this story, uh, when we were chatting at the phone, you told me something pretty interesting. So I never knew if someone else, so some companies, were actually on the other side of this possible platform, which, which can be automatic. And what's your take on, on, on this? What do you know about that kind of companies, not automatic in the specific, but those companies that do these kind of services? For us, they are a gold mine, uh, because basically we are asked to um, support EU policies uh, by having an understanding of the real world, but we do not have eyes everywhere. And if anybody else was able to put their eyes around, then we are very willing on buying that data that let us better understand, again, mobility needs and what is happening out there in the world because we have certification uh, that, um, let's say, defines nominal values for things, but then you have reality and you need to understand how is reality. If this differs, uh, and how much from the nominal values for things. Um, our project is on cars, but there are uh, other examples to, to that. So, uh, for example, we are very much interested into monitoring the gap between nominal fuel consumption values from cars, and right now that we have electric vehicles, also energy consumption of electric vehicles, and monitor the difference with what you achieve in real world. Uh, so this is the gap. And data sets like uh, the data set you mentioned from this company is something that let us understand in one instant what is the average fuel consumption value of a circulating fleet of vehicles in Europe in different countries, which is something that we also want to understand because if we carry out our own test activities, maybe we will reach out to people that are close to our area. So this is a biased sample or a subset of the population you would like to, to track. So if somebody was able to reach out to many people and collect uh, data in a diversified way from many sources, this is something that is very, very valuable to us as a research group that needs understanding of what's happening in reality. So that's interesting. So yeah, there is a customer and actually I've been knowing one and, and I didn't know. And uh, uh, you're telling me a couple of things more with this, which is there are other companies then doing something similar to what Automatic is doing. Yes, yes, yes. And are they offering kind of different services to, to the user? So uh, have different user experiences in comparison to the one I, I, I mentioned? Do they do different things for, for the final person? Yeah, I can speak about the ones that we used, that we took advantage of, and these specific services were about fuel consumption monitoring and reporting. So some sort of uh, website or uh, smartphone application where users would, uh, would insert the driven distance, the fuel they would use, also maybe something about uh, speed. And one of these services had something like you say. So one of these devices connected to the vehicle and constantly sending information over to their server. So they are able to derive every quantity they, they would like to derive or simply sell the whole dat data set to other uh, research centers that need uh, data for their own purposes. So you are telling me something more. There are companies that are actually doing something pretty similar. So there is a device, they are automatically gathering a huge amount of data for certain purposes to the customer. 
they gather them and you were actually you actually buy those data sets and there are other services in which is the user that is somehow creating those data you said there are websites where you put for example the amount of fuel you put in the car the amount of kilometers so obviously those data are less rich in comparison to the others but you even need that kind of data for, for your research. Yes, yes. And on top of being less rich as a data set, uh, this is also subject to human error when inserting this information. So this is a bit uh, trickier for us when we have to uh, get rid of outliers and, and we have to normalize the data before using them for our need. Okay, it's very interesting to, to see how a research institution that actually help in defining regulations, needs data to take decisions, to understand things, and to get this data is so difficult that actually you start from services that can gather them manually. And, and I can only imagine the amount of opportunities that this is uh, uh, opening. What you were saying brings us to a different aspect of this conversation. You were mentioning about uh, companies various kinds of services that do gather data to offer something to an end user, to a customer. And then you are on the other side, talking about platforms, gathering um, and using this data for research purposes. You work for the European Commission, so I'm absolutely sure about the answer you are going to give to this, to this answer. But I want to make it anyhow, since it's a very important topic in this kind of discussion. Do you have any access, any view on who generated those data? What kind of data you actually see when you buy these data sets? No, we don't have that type of information. We don't receive uh, personal data from the people who um, joined these uh, activities. Uh, we uh, get aggregated data that are also anonymized and we are barely uh, allowed to understand what type of vehicle was used. So we maybe get only the information whether it is a diesel engine, um, gasoline engine vehicle, and a few other uh, characteristics that are relevant to the vehicles, not to the user. Okay, and is, generating, is this generating any kind of issues for what you are doing? So do you care anything about who is the person that generated those data? No, as we said before, uh, we care about uh, data collection from the whole community. So we collect uh, data and we treat cases as a whole. We want a global picture, so we don't care on the one by one case. So the more data you have, the more valuable they are, but you don't care anything about who is behind the single data point. Exactly. And this leads us to, to the last part of our conversation. Uh, you know, we've got a personal relationship, so probably this conversation was kind of strange. But when I said, okay, uh, you can have my data in exchange of this interview, uh, you start asking things like, but if you wish, I cannot track your position. If you wish, uh, I can switch off some part of the, of the data that I'll be gathering and so on and so forth. And, you know, recording these kind of courses and talking about these kind of topics, it would be pretty strange, at least to me, saying, yes, please keep that away. Yeah, I don't want to share them, especially with you then. But what's the typical reaction to these kind of, uh, of questions? So how is finding people that do participate in this kind of project? As long as we reach out to the eco nerds how we call them it's very easy to get fuel consumption data so it's people that typically uh, take care of how much fuel they are consuming so they are a hundred percent open to share this data and also they can track in a better way how much fuel they are consuming but then we also say that this device is not only recording fuel but also recording how you drive so uh, if you comply with the speed limits on public roads or where are you going? When are you taking your car? Is it day? Is it night? So some people uh, react badly when we say, for example, that we are going to record GPS positioning because this really uh, enables us to understand 
how the vehicle is used and what a person is doing in uh, its private time. But as said before, we treat data as a whole. And anyway, in order to reach out to more people, to get more volunteers for our project, we provide different options for joining us. So if they are completely open, we ask to get the whole set of data because that's very useful to us. We put more context to our data. So in case we have anything to analyze deeper, we have data on the side that might help us to better understand something about fuel consumption mostly. Uh, but if people do not agree on sharing positioning, then we can get rid of that and only monitor the driving signals. So for example, speed or uh, uh, accelerator pedal, engine RPM, ambient temperature. Uh, the very, let's say, smallest set of data we uh, we, we offer, let's say, is only that from OBFCM, which are some something like counters that they are just accumulating, but we lose the second by second uh, picture of, of driving on public roads. So this is only to reach out to more people because we understand that my, some people might not feel comfortable with sharing that amount of data. So in order to still collect the data we really need, which is the average fuel efficiency and energy consumption from vehicle, we are also okay with receiving a smaller data set. You are saying two amazing things for people that talk about platform. The first thing was related to the people that more easily accept to share this data, and you were calling them eco? Eco nerds. So people that are interested in, in the kind of work you are doing, basically, probably you, it's not enough to have them on board because you need a wider picture. But uh, and we it, cannot only have eco nerds; otherwise, that would be a biased sample. Exactly. Again, we yeah. have to reach out to, to some eco nerds, but also to non eco nerds. But there might be somehow a way to connect what you are doing with the people that actually create the data. So this is kind of interesting. And the second thing was related to the fact that uh, you can actually leave freedom to the end user uh, in, your, in your experiment, in your, in your project, to actually decide which data to put there or not. And this is something that is not very common in, uh, in, uh, from a user perspective, or better, it is common, but it is usually pretty hidden behind many features of the service. But it's very interesting to see that in a startup project, basically, it, it's something that you put at first, basically. You were mentioning something that is, in my opinion, potentially very, very interesting. You said the more data you allow us to get, the more we can actually understand about the consumption of the car. And you said, if I have the GPS uh, system, I know where you are, basically. <laughs> and so I was wondering, can you use this set of data to connect what is happening within the car with, uh, I don't know, what is happening outside the car, with other databases that are not related to these objects, but uh, can be available, I don't know, online from other providers or things like that. Definitely, this is something that we do and a reason why we ask for GPS positioning, for example, is that we are interested or we need to know if there is any road slope to account for. So your fuel uh, consumption increases when you're driving uphill and decreases when you're driving downhill. So from latitude and longitude, we could query services that return altitude profile of the trip that uh, the user is, is driving. But also we can connect this set of data to climatological data so that we can also derive other uh, quantities that we are not monitoring. We are monitoring, for example, average ambient temperature, but maybe also humidity could affect fuel consumption. You have to use your air conditioning system a bit more maybe if the humidity is high or solar radiation. This maybe will affect in a way that you have to use more the air conditioning again 
if you oh, feel so warm. It, it means the that not only you know that in my car there was a certain amount of degrees, but you know even the weather outside, the degrees outside, and so on and so forth, if you have the GPS, because you can use that as a, as a linking point, right? Yes, yes. And we can do this already. And something we might be doing in the future that we don't do right now is getting data on the traffic. For example, this could also be relevant to to uh, fuel consumption uh, analysis. Okay, so this was probably the most peculiar case we have in the entire course, something that don't look like a platform, and indeed so far it isn't because you are looking at from you're looking at the world of platforms from another side. But it is extremely interesting to see how research can be powered. By, by data that are gathered, in this case, through a prototype, uh, uh, an initial project, but that potentially can scale up and, uh, and leverage the data of thousands of people, even for the greater good of, of society and for the environment in this case. So thank you very much, Alessandro, for being here with us and for sharing your, your knowledge, your experience and your project with us. Thank you.